Buongiorno a tutti, amici, colleghi, professori. Oggi vi propria, pro, proponiamo un argomento di arte indiana poco conosciuto dal grande pubblico, ma anche poco studiato nelle università italiane, la pittura stoffa, fatta citra, un'arte antica ma viva ancora oggi, che appartiene ai villaggi e a alcuni gruppi tribali indiani. Nell'India odierna vi sono due grandi tradizioni di Pattacitra, quella dell'Orisa, di cui parlerà la dottoressa Tiziana Lorenzetti, e quel del Bengal occidentale, che tratterà la professoressa Sanjutta Das Gupta. Uh, friends, uh, good morning to everyone, um, um, uh, colleagues and professors. Today we propose this, uh, a subject of Indian art uh, largely unknown to the general public, but also within academia, paintings on cloth, uh, it's called Patta Chitra. It's an ancient art, but still very much alive, which belongs, of course, uh, alive in, in several Indian villages, but to certain tribal groups. In contemporary India, there are two main traditions of Patachitra in Odisha, a topic that Dr. Tiziana Lorenzetti will tell us about. And in West Bengal, uh, in the, the presentation made by Professor Sanjukta Das Gupta. Um, before I invite uh, Dr. Tiziana Lorenzetti, uh, allow me to introduce uh, or read out a few uh, lines about uh, her. Uh, Tiziana Lorenzetti got a PhD in Indian Art. Uh, she was postdoctoral fellow at the National Museum Institute of the History of Art of New Delhi. Uh, lecturer in Indian Art at the Università of Rome, uh, Sapienza, visiting professor at the Università di Naples Orientale. Um, she's been a research associate uh, at the Manchester University, UK, and the visiting professor at the Bonn University. Uh, project curator and scientific referee for the photographic exhibition, The Sikhs, History, Faith, and Valor in the Great War in collaboration with the UK Punjab Heritage Association, the Anad Foundation, New Delhi, and the British Library of London. It was my, in fact, a pleasure for me to, to uh, join uh, uh, that celebration, which was done, I think, in 2015. Um, several recordings from the concert that I gave uh, and the little talk I gave, uh, except are there on YouTube and on social media. Uh, Tiziana Lorenzetti is the founding member and the director of the uh, International Institute of South Asian Studies, um, I, ISAS, is it called, and where, in fact, where I'm based right now since. Uh, January 1st, I came to Italy. January 16th, I came here curating a project with the International Institute of South Asian Studies uh, and um, Monsieur Della Civilta, uh, you know, uh, in Eur and the Indian Embassy, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were other foundations and organizations in Italy that we were doing. Unfortunately, because the COVID 19 uh, global pandemic was declared, March 7th concert at the Museo Della Civilta was cancelled. But then I've been stranded here since. So I'm so very, um, you know, it's been a pleasure. In fact, we've been curating things since then. We've not, uh, we've not been idle. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, to come back to Dr. Tiziana's uh, research interests, which include Hindu architecture and iconography. Um, um, titolo della conferenza è il Pattacitra dell'Orisa, dimensione onorica e rituale di un'arte antica. Um, a little abstract in Italian, um, l'argomento della pre presentazione della dottoressa Tiziana Lorenzetti uh, riguarda l'anisi dei Pattacitra dell'Orisa in un aff affascinante viaggio nello spazio pittorico, pittorico di queste opere, dove il tempo mitologico si fonde con quello storico rituale la dottoressa Lorenzetti uh, ci gu guiderà attraverso immagini tratte dai miti, immagini di divinità e rappresentazione dei rituali che si celebrano nel grande tempio di Jagannath a Puri. 
un arte stra, stra, straordinario, straordinario, pardon, mi scusi, straordinario che ha il palpito vitale che nasce dalla devozione del fedele per la divinità. Um, so, this is uh, uh, a little introduction uh, of Dr. Tiziana Lorenzetti. Uh, now I welcome uh, Dr. Tiziana Lorenzetti uh, uh, to, the, to the show. In fact, before I um, uh, come, to, um, uh, come to your presentation, now that I have all three of, all, all three of us, in fact, on the screen, um, uh, I, I, would, I would request you to say a welcome note, both of you, starting with Tiziana. You can say hello to our listeners and watchers and uh, uh, those who are joining today and those who will benefit, uh, uh, you know, from the recording placed on the social media in the near future. Uh, mm -hmm. Tiziana, first you, yes. Um, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Baldeep, uh, Maestro by Baldeep Singh, uh, good friends, and buongiorno a tutti, e in particolare agli amici del, um, che da anni seguono le, le attività della ISAS, l'Istituto Internazionale di Studi Sudasiatici. E quindi in questo momento difficile per tutti, in questa modalità live streaming, vi proponiamo uh, questa conferenza. E mia e anche con la, con la partecipazione della, della professoressa Das Gupta. E, e ancora grazie, thank you very much to Baldip, who is the chairman of this uh, little conversation. E, la, dunque, io appunto parlerò della pittura su stoffa, patta citra, patta vuol dire appunto stoffa e citra pittura, dell'Orissa, uno dei la produzione di Mata Citra è il villaggio di Raghurajpur, che si trova a pochi chilometri da Tadipuri, un centro di pellegrinaggio e sede di un maestoso tempio eh, di cui appunto dopo diremo qualcosa. Allora, eh, in questo villaggio di Raghurajpur, the next please, eh, ci sono gli artisti. Eh, All'indipendenza dell'India in poi, quando il eh, neonato governo indiano, su, eh, sullo stimolo di una donna di vedute lungimiranti, Kamaladevi Chattopadhyaya, che era mia eroe della figlia Indira, decise di dare vita a progetti di salvaguardia dell'artigianato indiano. E fu così che Ragura Jipur, che prima ospitava una ristretta cerchia di eh, maestri nell'arte Pattacitra, eh, i Citrakar, divenne un villaggio dove tutti si dedicano alla pittura e pensate che anche le case sono dipinte e, next one please con immagini floreali di divinità induiste ma specialmente con episodi dei grandi poemi epici del Ramayana e del Mahabharata e vedete eh, le case, cioè anche il portico delle case è eh, dipinto next please e alcune case come, come questa hanno il tetto in, eh, in foglie di palma, come eh, spesso succede, ma sono anche, hanno un, eh, un significato importante perché eh, fanno sì che il sole proteggono, proteggono il sole dal sole e, e dalla pioggia. Eh, next please, alcune volte appunto spesso le case sono dipinte appunto non solo all'esterno ma anche nel portico e anche le, le porte, le finestre e, e, e infine eh, next please, qui eh, abbiamo una, eh, una immagine che mi è molto cara perché eh, mh, ho fotografato tre generazioni di artiste eh, e eh, la signora nel mezzo è eh, la, uh, diciamo, la, la maestra di eh, non solo queste pitture sui muri ma si dedicano anche alla creazione di piccoli animali e eh, che vengono pitturati e, quindi, e poi venduti. Eh, quindi eh, gli stessi temi del, um, della mitologia e i temi floreali vengono anche dipinti su um, foglie di palma essiccati. Un, the next please. Un procedimento antico, qui vedete una ragazza, una giovane artista impegnata quindi proprio a uh, dipingere 
eh, questi, mh, questi temi della mitologia su fogli di palma e, e, so, e poi la narrazione è, è, praticamente poi, è, si, è, è, diventa una specie di, di libro ripiegato a soffietto e è, è, una, è una tradizione molto antica e quando eh, i cantori andavano eh, anche secoli fa di villaggio in villaggio cantando le gesta degli eroi le facevano anche vedere è un po' anche come succedeva nel nostro medioevo. Um, quindi oltre alla pittura sulle foglie di palma, abbiamo visto sulla, eh, sul, sui muri, le abbiamo finalmente anche su questa stoffa, i famosi patta citra. The next please. E sono famosi, eh, veramente opere famose anche presso gli indiani stessi, tant'è vero che quando nel 2016 il mh, Premier Modi si recò in visita ufficiale dall'allora Premier de Hollande in Francia, portò in dono proprio una pittura uh, di un pattacitra realizzata da uno dei più famosi maestri eh, artisti di, proprio di Raguraj Pur. Mi sembra che fosse l'albero della vita, molto bella. E, il procedimento di queste pitture è abbastanza complesso, De pezze di stoffa, anche vecchie sari, vengono cosparse di una colla ricavata dalla bollitura di semi di tamarindo e triturati. E, e poi il tutto viene lasciato seccare al sole e poi levigato con una posita pietra. Next, please. Ecco, qui vedete un maestro che, eh, in quest'arte che sta levigando, questa sta preparando la superficie appunto dove poi mh, verrà eh, eseguito il disegno. La pietra eh, non deve essere né troppo pulita né troppo liscia, quindi la superficie appunto deve essere preparata in modo ehm, preciso. Eh, si procede poi al disegno e si applicano in genere i colori eh, che sono tratti da sostanze mh, del mondo na, 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 naturale. E next please. E anche se eh, ultimamente ovviamente eh, si usano anche dei pigmenti sintetici. Ecco, qui vedete anche il maestro mh, che è nell'atto di eh, dare il colore eh, alla, mh, ai, alla, al disegno. E, mh, a, parte le, delle, a parte le scene mitologiche, le immagini delle divinità, gli artisti di Ragu Rajpur eh, raggiungono la vetta più alta nell'arte pattacitra, next please, in pure particolari. E sono delle opere, mh, next please, eh, sono delle opere eh, anche molto grandi, che mh, anche, mh, arrivano a un due metri di, di altezza, un metro e mezzo di larghezza e ehm, sono mh, allo stesso tempo delle opere che sono una narrazione e come vedremo eh, anzi va varie narrazioni che si intersecano le une nelle altre, sono oggetti di devozione e celebrazione di un dio che eh, si chiama Jagannath, come la parola ci dice Nath vuol dire signore, Jagat universo, il signore dell'universo. Jagannath è poco noto nella tradizione culturale dell'induismo tradizionale, e è una divinità particolare dell'Orissa e di origine tribale e come spesso accade è stato inglobato nella tradizione sanscritistica bramanica, che è chiamata anche la grande tradizione o la alta tradizione, come una forma di Krishna che a sua volta sapete è l'ottava incarnazione o discesa avatar di Vishnu. Il culto di Jagannath si concentra presso il grande tempio di Puri, e, e, e poiché queste pitture pattacitra sono eh, connesse a questo tempio, dato che lo rappresentano e rappresentano anche Jagannath, prima di addentrarsi nella narrazione, addentrarci nella narrazione di, dello spazio pittorico di, di questi pattacitra, lasciatemi dire due parole eh, sul, eh, sul tempio di Puri. Next, please. Eh, eh, il Tempio di Puri è un tempio del XII secolo, è una vera e propria città templare, eh, molto grande, noi occidentali non possiamo entrare, infatti lo, lo si vede da una terrazza antistante il santuario. E qui vedete eh, le mh, tre strutture principali, la torre santuario in fondo, che mh, nel nord è generalmente detta Shikara, mh, qui in Orista si chiama Reha, 
e due strutture che sono due sale ipostile dalle coperture formate da una serie di lastre orizzontali decrescenti, si chiamano PIDA e su queste faccio notare solo un particolare, eh, ci sono leoni e, le, o, e, o leogrifi e uno, una iconografia mh, su cui torneremo e che è comune a molti templi indiani, in particolare i templi dell'Orissa. Dunque, eh, questo, in questo tempio di Jagannat, eh, nel Garbagria, il Santa Santorum, ospita tre divinità. Next, please. Eh, Jagannat, abbiamo detto, il signore dell'universo e del mondo, eh, Balarama, il fratellasso di Krishna, e eh, Subhadra, la sorella di Balarama. Eh, le loro iconografie, vedete, sono particolari e molto diverse, del tutto diverse dalle iconografie classiche a cui siamo abituati. Eh, i, I tuoi tre personaggi sono vagamente antropomorfi, ma d'altra parte il corpo non si vede mai perché sono, è ricoperto da vesti eh, preziose e ghirlande floreali, e, mh, sono di legno, sono, hanno un'altezza di circa due metri e già è la divinità scura. Nel mese di maggio-giugno, quindi adesso, proprio in questo periodo, le immagini vengono portate eh, fuori, poste su carri e portate fuori dal tempio in processione. È il famoso Rata Yatra, Rata vuol dire carro, e mh, percorrono le vie della città. E ecco qui, next please, vedete una mh, di queste mh, immagini di Rata Yatra a cui partecipano migliaia e migliaia di devoti che, eh, provenienti da tutta l'India. L'origine tribale di Javandat si avvince anche dalla mitologia e in uno dei miti più diffusi si narra che eh, un sovrano di Puri, per annettere al suo regno alcune mh, tribù dell'Orissa, avesse accolto nel pantheon induista l'immagine lignea della divinità che queste tribù veneravano, appunto Javandat, inglobandola poi nella tradizione classica come una forma di Krishna. Eh, altri miti anche eh, sostengono questa integrazione e anzi alcuni tentano anche di giustificare questa forma particolare, anzi questa non forma di Jagannath e dei suoi fratelli. Eh, lo Skanda Purana ad esempio ehm, ci dice che l'immagine di Jagannath è, è così eh, quindi è perché sarebbe una non finita, sarebbe un'immagine scolpita solo in parte dall'architetto divino Vishvakarma. Eh, oppure eh, ci sarebbe una volontaria individuazione, cioè una discesa nella materia, quindi una manifestazione volontaria della divinità che eh, come, noi, come noi sappiamo comincia dal volto, eh, pensate per esempio agli, agli Ekamukalinga dove Shiva emerge dal linga eh, e, viene, e quindi emerge eh, prima la testa, in questo modo la, la, la testa di Jagannath e dei fratelli è predominante perché starebbe emergendo dal, diciamo, dal sarebbe emergendo, cioè sarebbe individualizzando e quindi materializzando. E, quindi il processo di integrazione di questi culti tribali nella grande tradizione è eh, affascinante specialmente in Orissa, perché l'Orissa eh, eh, fornisce un buon esempio di quello che gli archeologi, eh, quello che viene definito la, una incorporazione attraverso un incapsulamento, uh, incorporation through encapsulation, è un metodo uh, attraverso cui il, si crea una nicchia per diverse fedi all'interno di una struttura più generale che però non è solo religiosa ma è anche di pratiche sociali. E veniamo allora uh, all'analisi di queste opere straordinarie il cui linguaggio pittorico si tramanda da secoli e con minime varianti. Next please. Sono qui illustrati in una combinazione di iconografie classiche e folk, episodi tratti dalla mitologia, ma anche i rituali che si svolgono nel Tempio di Jagannath. E il tempo mitologico, come ha detto giustamente il maestro Bai Baldip Singh, si fonde con quello storico rituale e l'uno confluisce nell'altro secondo delle relazioni spaziali e temporali particolari. Uh, al centro, next please, inseriti in un'architettura che riproduce la torre santuario del tempio di Jagannath a Puri, ci sono le tre divinità, Jagannath, Balarama e Subhadra, vedete. Nel registro inferiore i bramini del tempio preparano i campanelli per la funzione, la puja. Uh, molte funzioni nei templi induisti, ma anche buddhisti, 
si servono del suono di queste piccole campane e eh, il loro uso ha molti significati, non solo marcano l'inizio della Puggia, ma eh, aiutano il devoto a disconnettersi con il mondo ordinario, evocando, si dice, consonanze vibratorie nei centri coscienziali di chakra. Non a caso sono formati da una miscela particolare di vari metalli, e la proporzione di questi metalli è segreta, che eh, appunto farebbe produrre a queste campane un suono di molto particolare. Poi ci sarebbe poi tutta la simbologia del suono, però magari ne parleremo in un'altra occasione. Nel registro ancora inferiore tre divinità tribali, che sono state identificate con Lakshmi, la sposa di Vishnu, Sarasvati, la sposa di Brahma e Revati, eh, la sposa di Balarama. Ancora sotto due immagini speculari di Vishnu a quattro braccia di colore azzurro, blu. Ai lati di questo spazio sacro e rituale, circoscritto dal perimetro della torre santuario, ci sono due santuari minori. Next, please che ospitano ognuna una divinità con quattro braccia, la cui postura e i cui gesti rimandano al trio centrale. Allora, eh, a sinistra, on the left, Shiva, Shiva con il tridente, il classico tridente, il serpente sulla testa, la figura sulla testa, probabilmente un naga, queste divinità acquatiche, serpentine, le cui raffigurazioni sono tanto comuni nei tempi dell'Orissa e le altre due mani sono nella postura di Angiali Mudra, il classico gesto di devozione. A destra right, c'è Brahma con i quattro volti dell'iconografia classica, infatti Brahma è il creatore dell'universo e i quattro volti simboleggiano il dispiegarsi dell'energia divina secondo le quattro direzioni cardinali a definire lo spazio. E poi c'è il Kamandalu, il classico recipiente di acqua lustrale, che è portato anche dagli asceti hindu. Um, lo spazio sopra le architetture templari, next please, the section above, è, è, è occupato um, da, uh, da sinistra e destra da due episodi del Ramayana. Um, on left, next please, il rapimento di Sita, e anche se alcuni maestri pittori pensano si tratti di un episodio connessa ad un altro mito um, e uh, on the right l'uccisione del demone Ravana da parte di Rama e accompagnato dal fratello Lakshmana qui l'iconografia sostiene l'interpretazione perché eh, Rama, eh, Ravana appare con le dieci teste dell'iconografia tradizionale e, um, le due narrazioni monosceniche immortalano quasi come in un foto fotogramma due momenti drammatici della, da, nella, della narrazione mitica. Uh, al centro, next please, eh, le due scene sono separate da un'immagine di Krishna, vedete di colore blu, con le gopi, le pastorelle, delimitati da uno spazio ricurvo che come fosse un ponte, sembra unire spazialmente e concettualmente i due episodi della Mayana. Eh, al di sotto dell'uccisione di Ravana, next please, appare una fila di scimmie. Vedete? Eh, sono, è un, um, a ricordare, stanno a ricordare l'aiuto che Rama ebbe dal popolo delle scimmie, comandato da Anuman, il dio scimmia che è molto venerato in India. Invece, on the left, eh, a sinistra, sotto il rapimento di Sita, eh, c'è la celeberrima iconografia di Vishnu addormentato sul serpente Shesha in versione tribale. Eh, I due personaggi, vedete come spesso succede nell'antica arte indiana, eh, il dio e Lakshmi, la sposa che gli massaggia i piedi, sono visti da vari punti di vista. Vishnu è visto dall'alto, mentre la consorte è di profilo. Pensiamo ai rilievi di Barut, dello stupa di Barut, dove appunto i vari personaggi sono visti da diversi punti di vista. Oh, più in basso, next please, c'è una ultima sezione molto interessante, è una narrazione lineare composta di vari episodi in successione temporale. Allora, um, all'inizio sulla, sulla sinistra vediamo la sfilata dei carri, ratagliata che si svolge effettivamente a Puri, di, di Javernat, Balarama e Subhadra. E, I carri si preparano ad uscire dal recinto templare. E, abbiamo poi Garuda su un pilastro, e Garuda stamba, stamba e pilastro. Garuda è l'uomo uccello, veicolo di Vishnu. 
il Vaha è diviso. E l'immagine rimanda effettivamente proprio al tempio dove c'è eh, davanti al santuario un, una colonna dove, eh, sulla cui sommità eh, c'è Garuda. E, è molto venerata questa colonna, i devoti la toccano, la abbracciano e, e dai giornali indiani ho saputo che adesso ai tempi del coronavirus eh, Modi ha eh, proibito di eh, toccare e accostarsi alla colonna e che potrebbe essere un veicolo di contagio. Ehm, allora, eh, poi abbiamo due leoni addorsati, vedete, eh, in eh, una postura rampante e eh, anch'essi rimandano al santuario dove abbiamo visto abbondano le immagini di leoni o leogrifi. E sono questi del simbolo regale, simbolo di forza, sono collegati sia con la divinità ma soprattutto con eh, il, il sovrano e la dinastia, il sovrano che ha patrocinato la costruzione del tempio e quindi eh, esprimono anche la forza della dinastia stessa. D'altronde la storia dell'India è costellata di sovrani e anche filosofi che si chiamano Narasimha, cioè uomo leone. Nel mezzo c'è il carro di Jagannath, vedete, raffigurato frontalmente che procede come per venire incontro all'osservatore. I carri arrivano poi al tempio di una divinità femminile che si chiama Gundicia. E la vedete rappresentata di colore scuro perché anch'essa eh, era una divinità tribale che è stata assimilata al, nella grande tradizione con eh, una, una forma, cioè un ruolo particolare, è la zia, sarebbe la zia di Jagannath. In realtà, dato che Gundi in origlia vuol dire vaiolo, Gundicia probabilmente era un'antica divinità tribale che proteggeva appunto dal, dal vaiolo era la dea del vaiolo. Nell'arte nell dell'India antica, ma anche nella nostra arte occidentale, si usa anche il simbolismo proporzionale, e cioè si raffigura in dimensioni maggiori il personaggio che si vuole far risaltare. Qui la nera gondicia è più piccola dei devoti, e io suppongo che questo perché si voglia porre l'accento sull'atto di devozione. Le divinità eh, sostano sette giorni nel tempio della zia di Gundicia e poi ritornano e nell'ultimo riquadro abbiamo un riquadro che è di difficile interpretazione, è il luogo della cremazione di Puri, vedete la spiaggia che è sulla spiaggia e c'è questo pesce nell'acqua. Ehm, gli antichi sovrani di Puri ehm, effettua, usavano effettuare dei rituali su questa spiaggia eh, proprio durante la processione dei carri e non solo, poiché è la, il luogo delle cremazioni, Cremare i, i, i morti durante il Rata Yatra era eh, assai propizio e quindi eh, questo pannello ben si accosta proprio alla narrazione del Rata Yatra perché eh, sono eventi che si svolgono durante, durante il pellegrinaggio. Infine, infine, next one please. Racchiudono l'intero spazio pittorico, in alto e in basso, quindi dalla, di tutto il dipinto, le dieci eh, discese eh, di Vishnu. Eh, abbiamo eh, il pesce Mazia, la tartaruga, eh, il cinghiale, Narasina l'uomo leone, Vamana il nano, Parashurama il cacciatore con la scura, poi qui abbiamo Krishna. E poi Rama, in realtà, cioè in realtà generalmente Rama viene prima e Krishna dopo, poi abbiamo Jagannat come la nona incarnazione, eh, nella tradizione c'è Balarama o Buddha, dipende, e poi vedete sul cavallo l'incarnazione di Vishnu del futuro e Kalki. Ecco, io eh, abbiamo così concluso questo approccio, questo breve approccio a queste opere che complici questi colori vivaci e anche eh, brillanti perché danno poi, mh, spalmano un coppale lucido sulla pittura e mh, hanno, mi danno quasi l'impressione di avere una dimensione onirica e un, un palpito vitale eh, che spesso molte opere indiane hanno, questa in particolare, che nasce proprio dalla devozione del fedele per la divinità. E, oltre a ringraziare di nuovo il maestro Bai Baldip, ringrazio per questa, questa ricerca sul campo a Raghuraggiopur che si è svolta molti anni fa, forse 15, forse anche di più, il professor Fabio Scialpi della Sapienza di Roma e il dottor Devdas Mohanti che si occupava e credo si occupi ancora di comunità tribali. Quindi grazie a tutti. Um, and I see, I've seen images of you 
uh, in the in one of the photos you were there with the with the artists. Uh, which year was that? When did you go um, uh, to the to the uh, uh, to the, to Odisha? I think. When? Uh, yeah. when, when, when did start this uh, kind of? Um, uh, um, it is not easy to say, but uh, um, the Patachitra, actually, my paintings on cloth has been uh, mentioned in the Purana and uh, in the epics uh, as well, uh, and um, which go back uh, around the first centuries of Christian era. Um, but uh, there are many, many kind of Patachitra in India. Uh, um, for instance, in uh, Andhra Pradesh, we have the Kalamkari um, in a village near Lepakshi. In Rajasthan, there is the Natvada, Nat, Nat, Natvara. And, but this kind of Patachitra in Orissa are very peculiar because um, the, the, cut, the, the, the clothes is made uh, like, uh, like a paper, a hard, hard paper. Is not like really like a cloth because uh, I, I I told you the 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 the, 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 the different and difficult procedure and um, this particular patricitra from Orissa uh, is uh, it seems to um, to uh, to be in Rose, uh, Rosen shortly after the construction of the Jagannath Temple at Puri in the 12th century. Um, because uh, since uh, the wooden image of uh, in the temple of Jagannath um, and uh, brothers and sisters were periodically taken out of the temple, um, whether uh, for uh, in, in the Ratha Yatra or for other purposes, um, in order to avoid um, that the Garbagriya remained empty, empty, the Brahmins uh, started to put in place of the original uh, sculpture the hanging clothes, uh, clothes uh, made uh, like uh, hard, hard paper with the images of the deities. And so from there started the um, tradition of the Pat Orissa's Pat Pat Patachitra. I see. And when you went uh, in, in Orissa, uh, which year was that? It was the 90s, is it? Uh, I don't remember. The, yes. Ah, okay. Because and I the, went so many times. And and the, less than 90, 20, 99, 20, 21, 22, okay. yes. For us, 15 right. years ago, but it's still the same in Raigo Rajpur, still they are doing the same. The, same, I the see. tradition and, is continuing. I see. And uh, the painting that you showed us, the Patachitta that you showed, was this, uh, you got it made for yourself or is generally that they make regularly? Was this something that they was done They made for you? regularly, but okay. also, also, of course, you can buy, you can buy because they yes, live of course. also oh, as a yeah. and the, and the important uh, handicraft, yes. And, but there are who, a lot of... Who buys them? Like people for they place them in their houses or put them on the walls like yes, decoration. Yes. Who are the clients? Who buys not only uh, tourists but uh, all the Indians who goes in pilgrimage to the temple or the temple of the Puri temples, and they want to buy the uh, patachita with all, with the, the 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 image of the temples and the um, uh, the rituals and everything so that they 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 will buy for uh, yeah for faith so, for the this faith. is uh, this is more of a uh, like a tourist purchase uh, it's like a souvenir or when the did you um, converse with people who buy whether or they install these patachitras in their sacred spaces in their personal or private temples. Yes, is it I think just so. uh, walls or uh, in in their own personal temples. Yes, yes, yeah. I saw. So I 
I gifted the Pachachi to some Indian friends. They immediately put uh, them in a, a particular uh, wall uh, in, in their uh, ho house uh, uh, century. Uh, in a whole, yes. Sacred, in a sacred space, it basically. In, yeah, in a sec yes. So it's not treated as a, a just a painting object, on the wall, but it is a sacred it space. It is an object of devotion for I some see. of them, of course. Course, not for all. Yeah, yeah, I see. Well, thank you. And and are there still Patachitra centers in Odisha, or is it just Jagannath Puri, uh, or or it's like a art form which is really practiced by many people? Um, there are um, yes, uh, um, Raghurajpur is the main center of Patachitra in Odisha, but there are other two other two places. One is Sola Sole, is Sonepur, Sonepur, and there is another village, uh, uh, and there are also another place in Orissa. And, uh, That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to you. Thank I, you to you. I learned, uh, I'm, uh, my apologies uh, on behalf of Nirbala, in fact, uh, that they were not able to uh, keep up the images, but I'm sure uh, uh, people uh, saw and they will be able to see the images. Uh, the video was going uh, uh, from up and down. I'm sure they were able to understand and follow uh, your narration. Um, uh, I will now um, turn to uh, Professor Sanjukta uh, Dasgupta. Um, she's, um, as you know, it's a coronavirus time. We are all joining. Uh, we are not in the university. We are not in the, you know, International Institute of South Asian Studies. We are all uh, under lockdown. Uh, if you're not a family member, uh, you cannot visit. The social, uh, you know, communications and travels are not really allowed as of now. So uh, all of all three of us are joining from our uh, respective quarters or headquarters, and uh, Professor Das Gupta is joining from her residence, her studio, her personal study. Um, uh, Professor Das Gupta, welcome uh, to uh, to the to a journey into pictorial space, <laughs> uh, Chitra of Orissa and West Bengal. It was quite enlightening, in fact. Uh, uh, the whole very intimate the way uh, the artists I have of course had the opportunity as part of the uh, you know uh, National Academy of Music Dance and Drama and also in which a lot of Katputlis you know the puppeteering and there's a whole allied art forms which are used uh, storytelling which is in which Patachitras and others are used by artists they take it and they would tell stories and then similar colors are used for other mediums as well apart from Patachitra and of course, in the Lalit Kala Academy, the Academy of Fine Arts and all that. So I've been associated, so I've seen, uh, uh, for me, it was very nostalgic to, to be in Rome and to mm -hmm. see the images go in front of me. And I was reminded of the uh, Aarti uh, of Guru Nanak when he visited Jagannath Puri. Uh, and uh, he is composed in Maithili, Gagana Maithar, Ravi Chandi, Pakabanitar, Kamandal, Janakamoti, Dhup Malayan, Lopavan Chagvaro, Kade Sagal Banarai, Fulant Jyoti. Kaisi Arati Hoy Pavakandana Teri Arati Anata Sabadwajanta Heri Sahasatava Nainan Nan Nain Hayat Hoyko Sahas Murtana Naik Tohi Sahas Pad Bibala Naik Pad Gandhi Sahasta Gandhi Vichalatam Hoy. Rabindranath Tagore had a very unique uh, relationship with the Arati of uh, Guru Nanak when he composed the national anthem, which is now the national anthem. He was asked in 1911, why don't you compose something? Why don't you write the anthem of the whole world? He says that was already written by Guru Nanak's. Uh, his arti, he has translated it as, as well. So reminded of Jagannath Puri and Bengal and the relationship and the, of the, the literary and the historical relationships between the grand masters of uh, India uh, and their communication, even if centuries apart, it's being very, uh, it's been... Uh, very nostalgic for me to uh, to listen to uh, Tiziana's uh, uh, you know uh, sharing and her, her uh, presentation, and I'm really looking forward to yours. Allow me before we before I come to you. Uh, allow me to introduce you, uh, friends. Uh, professor Sanjukta Das Gupta is an associate professor at the Department of Oriental Studies uh, of Sapienza University uh, of Rome. It's called Università della Sapienza. Uh, earlier, she had uh, been an associate professor at the uh, Department of History, uh, Kolkata University. 
Um, she's a member of the advisory committee of the European Association for South Asian Studies, EASS, and is on the editorial board of South Asia Multidisciplinary Academic Journal, uh, Samaj. Uh, her research interests include uh, agrarian uh, and environmental history and the social history of marginalized communities in colonial and post-colonial colonial India. Uh, she's the author of Adivasis and the Raj, Socioeconomic uh, Transition of the Horse, 1820-1932. It was published in 2011. Um, her uh, recent publications include the edited volumes, Narratives from the Margins, Aspects of Adivasi History and Culture in Colonial and Post-Colonial India uh, in 2019, and Subjects, Citizens and Law, Colonial and Independent India, 2017. Uh, the title of the talk today, Patachitras of Bengal, uh, is what she will be sharing with us, uh, Urban Transformation of a Rural Art Form. Um, her, um, um, you know, the uh, uh, presentation that uh, um, she's uh, uh, going to be um, uh, sharing with us would be um, about the forecart of Bengal, uh, West Bengal, I think. Uh, is that right? Uh, uh, this is this Bengal, is it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and of course, in, in in the in the course of the 19th and 20th century. So, uh, uh, welcome, uh, Sanjukta. We're really looking forward to your uh, sharing. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dean um, Baldeep Singh, and thank you very much, Titiana, for inviting me to participate in this talk. And I will be talking about the Potichitros of Bengal. And it's very interesting the relationship uh, that uh, these adjoining areas, Urisha and West Bengal, are uh, very close together. And we see the particular forms and the formats that the Potichitros have taken in Bengal. And in Bengal, these are the scroll paintings. Uh, may I have the first uh, the PowerPoint on, please? And the first um, slide on, please? Yeah, this is so uh, uh, these Chitra, these are the traditional scroll paintings in Bengal, and they are still practiced in uh, the rural districts. I will look at how these uh, this what was essentially a folk art transformed itself to address contemporary issues in an urban milieu, and how in this way we see that. Um, instead of disappearing over time, how it reinvented itself and makes itself relevant in the contemporary scene. Um, uh, I have to go back to the previous uh, slide, not this one, please. One second. found the problem. In fact, um, uh, slide number two. Okay, this is the, I think this, this is the first slide one, two. yes. Here we are. Is this the one? No, uh, I am not. Uh, I uh, okay. Uh, slide number, slide number two. Yes, the one with the lady on the right uh, showing the page. Yeah. Yes, this is the one. So yeah. I. Uh, Right, okay, let me just start once again. So I'm going to look at this transition of the uh, Potichitros. And in the second slide, I'll start with this. This is a Potichitro of the coronavirus, where we have the previous slide, please. Yes. Oh, okay. uh, we have uh, the Chitrakar, um, Shorna Chitrakar, uh, who has composed a song on uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and uh, this has really become viral on face, uh, Facebook in the social media. So can I have the video on? Um, let's just listen to the song once. Namaskar. I'm Shorno Chitrakar. Coronavirus is a very good I'm going to show you Sono o sono ho io godoia, tu mai già na ha bocca moni. Corona bhaira sir ko tha suni, bocco fette jai re, tu mai già na ha bocca moni. I'm 
Yes, so uh, we saw in this uh, video Shornu Chitrakar singing the song of coronavirus and uh, the pot was, as we saw, this is really a kind of entertainment. It's a dynamic oral and visual performance. So you have the scrolls with the paintings and there would be somebody singing the stories, usually of epic stories. and. Uh, for the performances, traditionally the Potuas would travel from village to village and they would receive uh, rice, food stuff. Sometimes they're lucky, they would also get some money, they would uh, uh, get uh, clothes, etc. And this is the art, the folk art, that was carried over to the metropolitan city of Calcutta with the migrant uh, labor, uh, uh, rural migrants uh, in the 19th century. And so in this, we will see how this entire folk tradition reinvented itself in an urban milieu and we will also look at how it addresses contemporary global concerns today. So let's go to slide number three. The next slide please. And so who are the Potuas or the Chitrogor? And they are usually known, but uh, no, normally they were called Potuas but nowadays they prefer the uh, name Chitrogor and Chitrogor is used as a surname by many of these Potuas. So they are the artisan community who are found in the states of West Bengal, Jharkhand, Bihar, many parts of Bangladesh. And Chitrakar, Potua is somebody who makes a pot and Chitrakar simply means a scroll painter. And um, the origin of the Chitra court, this is there are a lot of these stories about it and it's not really very clear. Uh, Tiziana talked about uh, the Chitra has been mentioned in very ancient texts, but um, so far as Bengal is concerned, uh, there are historical references to the Potuas dating back to the 13th century. And we find both the Potuas coming mon uh, from both the Hindu and Muslim community today. Most of the Potuas are Muslims and they come from very impoverished uh, Muslim families. Hindu Potuas are still to be found in Calcutta in certain localities, but they are really much fewer in number. And uh, it is said that, you know, put in the caste hierarchy, the Potuas did not rank very high. They were ranking low in the caste hierarchy. And it is said that uh, in their origin stories, they say that they actually had a much higher caste position, but they fell out with Brahmins and that is why they were outcasted. And what is interesting is that although most of the Potuas are from Muslim families, they continue with the traditional occupation of painting and modeling the Hindu idols and Hindu um, uh, religious stories. And they also observe, many of them observe both Hindu and Muslim religious uh, uh, rituals, and they also sometimes have two sets of names, Hindu and Muslim. We also have a number of tribal or Adivasi Potuas, particularly in the regions near the Adivasi areas. And um, another change that we see is that in tradition, the Potuas were usually men, and they were the ones who would provide the entertainment in the rural areas through their itinerant performances. The women would help at the homes. But today we see women coming forward. There are many women as Potuas. And so this gender divide between the uh, male performers and the women who stayed at home and helped uh, with the preparing of the pot, this gender divide is no more. And we have a greater visibility of the Potuas today. May I go to the next slide, please? And in this slide i would we see different forms of this pot potuchitra painting while the pots and 
are mainly scroll paintings. We also have some things called the Durga pot or the Durga Shara. And these are pictures, images of Durga, Goddess Durga painted on earthenware or clay pots. And um, these are also worshipped, especially during Durga Puja. So this is also a kind of a form of pottery through art. The next slide. The materials that are used for making these pots, these are usually today, they are made of sheets of paper of different sizes, which are sewn together. And they also have this backing of cloth. But traditionally, they would be painted on cloth. There were in older days, there were also uh, pots which were painted on palm leaves. The painting was done with natural colors, usually made with vegetable matter, with the vegetable dyes, indigo, turmeric. Also, they used a lot of these minerals. But uh, today, instead, we find that many potuas use, especially for the ones they are making for the mass market, the pots that they are preparing for the mass market, they use the commercial colors, poster paints, etc. But there are many potuas who still continue with this tradition of preparing vegetable dyes. The next slide, please. The potuchitras of Bengal are made in two formats. There are two types of potuchitras. Uh, please change the slide. So here in this slide, I'm just showing the different kinds of uh, potuchitra. There are basically two formats, two types. One is the what is called the Jorano or the Gotano pot, uh, the one that you see on the right. And this is a long scroll. It could be either vertical or it could be horizontal. And the stories would be sung and the pot would be unfurled uh, at the same time. And there is... On the left hand side, there is the choco pot. Choco pots are painted on square pot. These are square uh, pots on canvas or on paper. And uh, these are not scrolls. So the, the songs and there is no need to furl or unfurl them. So based upon these, the next one, we can actually I will be talking about three different kinds of pot that we find in Bengal. One is the famous urban recreation of the choco pot, which we will see in the next slide, which is the Kalighat pot, the Kalighat, the famous Kalighat paintings, which became very popular in 19th century Calcutta. Then I will also be talking about two other types of pot, the Jadu potuas, the Jadu pot or the Santal pot, which are uh, done by a community of potuas who had been living in close proximity with the Adivasi population. The word Jadu means magic. And the Jadu pot or the Santal paintings, these are associated with many rituals, rites, legends, myths, and beliefs, the life cycle of the Santals. And the songs are often sung in the Santali language. And the third kind of pot are the rural, the traditional rural pots, which have been reinvented today. And today we find one of the centers in Pingla, in the Pingla block in Western Midnapur district, particularly the Gram, the village Noya. And this village has been transformed today into a craft and cultural hub with the government support and also support of UNESCO. Now let's go to the next slide. And we will look at the principal themes, which are the subject matter of these pots. The majority of the subjects, of course, are religious in nature, and they tell of the Hindu and the Muslim tales. The next slide. Yeah, don't. Uh, are you looking at the Facebook uh, telecast right now? Live yes. streaming on Facebook? Don't look there. Okay, because all right. Okay, okay, I get yeah, it. Don't, don't follow that, yeah. OK, so um, we have these uh, different kind of themes in the pot and there were mainly, mainly these are of the religious themes dealing with the stories from uh, 
uh, Hindu mythology, Muslim story, um, uh, the, uh, the Muslim religious themes, and also the stories of the Ramayana were very popular. And there are other kind of mythological themes. Then stories of the Mangal Kavyas, the Mongol Kapo. These are the texts, the Bengali Hindu texts, which were written around, composed around the 13th to 18th centuries. And they really talk about the ways in which local deities were incorporated into the larger Hindu pantheon through a set of trials, etc. And today, they also are used as social commentaries, commentaries on politics, so uh, for uh, popular promotion of literacy, and also there are commentaries, uh, the prominent news events of the time, etc., like we saw in the coronavirus spot. The next slide. And now I will come to the Kalikhat pot. And this is in the 19th century. Uh, this was discussed in the book Parlor and the Streets by uh, Shumanto Banerjee. The rural people, when they migrated to the new metropolitan city of Calcutta, the, they brought and they became the urban working class. They brought over much of their folk culture, which had defined Bengal for centuries. And they would settle around the vicinity of this famous Kali temple in Kalighat because of this thriving market of visiting pilgrims. And there they would display their scrolls, they would perform in front of the audience. Now, so there was already a kind of a transition in their activity. So instead of the Potuas going, traveling from village to village, they now became stationary and they had instead visiting pilgrims who would watch them perform. So this was a kind of a reversal of their practice. The urban environment also changed their mode of painting and their choice of subjects. In the first place, gradually we see that the canvas rolls, the cloth rolls, were being replaced by cheap paper. Paper became available particularly from Serampur, a little north to Calcutta, where there were the Christian missionaries who had set up the printing press. And Potuas found this medium very useful for selling their painting uh, and rather than displaying or performing. So again, we see gradually a change coming up from performers, they became the sellers of their artworks. And at the same time, they began to introduce in their art form certain Western techniques, so which gave rise to a specific Kalikhat style of painting. Next uh, slide, please. So here we will look at some of these Kalikhat paintings. For instance, here we have some pictures of the Hindu divinities, goddess Durga. This scroll was in fact part of the consignment of Kalihat paintings that was acquired for the Indian Institute Library and Museum at Oxford in the 1880s. And there is also the pot showing goddess Kali. And the last one is the Ramayana pot. The uh, pot showing Kali and the Ramayana pot, these are to be found in Guru Sadayar Museum in Calcutta today. The next slide, please. Now, other than the Kalikhat pot, there were the, this, uh, while, uh, together with these uh, Hindu deities, there were also a number of pots which showed the lives of Muslim saints. And these are popularly called the Gaji pots. And usually they illustrate the story of the miracle working Muslim saints, saints like Gaji, saints like Ma uh, Manik. And these two pots that I sh uh, have over here, they are from the British Library collections. So one of them shows a rich merchant's ocean going ship under sail. And the other is uh, shows the tomb of a Muslim saint attended by a devotee. And Possibly the place of production was Murshidabad district. So this is not in the Kalikhat style. This is the rural pot that was already there, the Gaji pot. The next slide, please. Now, within the urban milieu of Calcutta in the 19th century, together with stories of uh, mythology stories of the Mongol Kapo, the Kalikhat paintings also began to expand their subject matters. So they added new themes like the social events in the city, 
um, themes uh, such as the newly educated, the anglicized class that was coming up, the English educated Babu, his wife, his mistress, social satires, and Calicut pots may, uh, may be divided into five principal groups. Pictures of mythological characters, the stories of relating to nature, still lives, then historical events, both contemporary and past historical events, descriptions of everyday life and characters, and very important, caricatures. The next slide, please. And we have in these new themes here, a very famous painting, Aina Shundori. So one of the new contemporary themes that were coming up, depiction of uh, women, uh, depiction of uh, real living people rather than just mythology. Now the next slide. In the next slide, uh, this is actually uh, the, the Kalikat paintings were also ways in which the contemporary news would be discussed, the contemporary scandals. And these were often a warning against immoral behavior. And in the next slide, we have this two pictures of uh, a sensational crime of passion, the Tarokishar affair, uh, the Tarokishar murder case of 1873, where you have this woman, Elokeshi, who was murdered by her husband, Nobin Chan, because she was having an affair with uh, the Mahant of Tarokeshwar Temple. So, you know, this was a big scandal of the times and this had a lot of, it was a number of depictions in the Kalikat paintings. The next slide, please. And above all, there are these scroll paintings mocking the mannerisms of the Bengali upper class. Babu culture was satirized in the pots because of the airs that they would put on the alien European mannerisms that they assumed. And there were also these fears of the new social mores that were coming up. So uh, education for women and the freedom, greater rights for women would end up um, uh, the uh, women beating up men as this particular slide shows. So this is in fact a very famous uh, Spot where the woman is beating up the man with a broomstick. Now, the next slide, I come to another form of Bengal pot, the Jadu pots. The Jadu, pot, the Jadu potuas were the painters and storytellers who, like the other potuas, could go from village to village, carrying their painted scrolls made of these paper sheets sewn together and they would have a bamboo uh, stick at each end and the story as it would go, they would roll up the stories. Now, Jadu, as I said, means magic. And the themes that the Jadu Putuas represented on the scrolls were actually more limited than the uh, themes that were of Hindu mythology, etc. In fact, the Jadu Putuas more or less would talk about, uh, would display around tw uh, a dozen themes. But each theme had its own different interpretation and the same scroll could be used for relating very different stories. And so the researchers have shown that the Jadu Potuas would sing different stories and would change the stories depending upon the audience. So there would be different stories for Hindus, there would be different stories for Muslims, different stories for Santals. And the last, the Santal, the Adivasi group, the Santals, this was the most important audience for the Jadu Potuas. The next slide, please. And of the Jadu Potuas uh, work, a very particular one is the Mrittu pot. The Mrittu means death, the death pot. So uh, the Mrittu pot or the image of death. So in the tribal villages, if somebody died in a village near the Jadu Potuas, the artist magician would visit the family of the dead with a small, very simple image. And that was supposed to represent the dead. Only the late person's pupil would be missing from this picture. 
and showing this image to the family uh, the jadu potua would tell the story of the suffering of the dead whose soul is still trapped in hell and once the family gives some offerings to the jadu potua the potua would then draw the pupil of the eye and release the person uh, the dead uh, person and free his soul so this is the ritual that the jadu potua performs let's go to the next time uh, next slide please now today much of the folk art of the potuchitro is concentrated in pingla block in western the midnapur and where the village noya has become a hub of the uh, art and craft the folk art and crafts but this was the result of a period of revival because from the late 19th century onwards this potua art began to decline in bengal this was because german photography oleography um, and the ability to reproduce pictures and very realistic pictures at a cheaper and a much faster rate this posed a challenge to the kalighat potuas and the middle class patrons the pilgrims etc they were now uh, charmed by the novelty of the realism that the photography represented and they were no longer interested in purchasing the kalighat pots and they began to go for the cheap reproductions and the potchitro um, slipped back into rural obscurity among the general public in the 1930s 1920s and 1930s it was revived somewhat thanks to the efforts of um, guru sadaidat the uh, ics officer whose collection of pots became a part of his bengal uh, folk art museum and uh, the revival of the potuchitra after independence started really around the 1970s thanks to the efforts of the west bengal crafts council and also i believe in uh, bangladesh at the same time the bangladesh based uh, banglanatuk.com also um, uh, had a major role in reviving the potuchitra in bangladesh there are also many other private foundations like the uh, daricha foundation ratnabuli bos who all popularized uh, the folk art as they looked upon this as a means of empowering rural women through the arts now ruby pal choudhury who was one of the founding members of the crafts council of west bengal in she recalls that when they were reviving were attempting to revive the potua art they took some of the potuas to the guru sadaya museum to reacquaint them with what their ancestors had done because many of them had forgotten these traditions now and also the craft council concentrated on training the women as i had said the women themselves had participated behind the scenes helping in the family helping preparing the paint etc but they were not allowed to go out and uh, perform but once they with the crafts council with the uh, kind of um, encouragement they received they began to get public recognition they came to the public forum and they began to get training for the first time and many of them now practice and they have supported by their families so today we see a kind of a feminization of the folk art and the women artists have now a new visibility and in noya the village where which has become the center of this art uh, which is about 60 kilometers away from calcutta there are now cooperative set up for example the noya potua mohila unnayan samiti the women's self help association which looks into the promotion of this art and also they organize uh, an annual festival the pot maya for propagating for popularizing the art the next uh, slide please and this really has helped in empowering the women um, and here we have for example a very famous well known artist monimala chitrakar i had interviewed her some uh, two years ago and uh, monimala uh, though of course here the quotation i have used this is taken from another book and uh, by lina uh, futsethi 
And Munimala said that she took to the art because she needed to earn money. And she spent a lot of time observing the painters, listening to their songs. And she painted at night and she was just a beggar. And her grandfather was a Potua artist. And her grandfather said that it was not simple enough to paint. They also had to learn to sing. And so Monimala, her aunt, her mother, they all learned to sing. And then they began to accompany her grandfather to the different art fairs to display and sell the work. And because of this, Monimala is today very successful. And she says that she has been to the United States and she uh, has traveled widely in India and abroad. And she's very proud of, and very rightly so, very proud of her accomplishments. Um, one thing that Monimala also says that there is still um, a lot of pressure on the women about their participation in this craft, especially uh, around Western Midnapur region, there is a new wave of uh, uh, Islam, Islamization and uh, the religious leaders do not approve of the women painting pots uh, depicting Hindu gods. And Monimala told me that she preferred, she, she actually did not uh, listen to these kind of uh, dictates and she always told the younger generation to develop this art so that they could go beyond the confines of Noya. The next slide, please. Now, Noya today has developed into a kind of a center, a hub of uh, the uh, Potichitro art. And they not only do they produce um, the pot to pot, the potuas of this region, they also make a range of diverse products like clothes, stationary items, home decor, using the Potichitro motives. And uh, in fact, uh, in Noya, in, uh, in fact, the whole of Pinla, there is the geographical indication tag, which they have received. The next slide, please. And here we are just we see some of these uh, very popular themes. This is a theme from Monisha Mongol, uh, the Mongol Kapu, uh, and uh, where the story is that uh, Monusha, we see at the right hand side, the goddess is Monusha and she is the snake goddess and she wants to be worshipped and she uh, asks a devotee of Shiva, uh, Chand Shodagar, to worship her. He refuses. As a result, Chand Shodagar's family faces a lot of trials, tribulations and the middle, in the center, we have Chand Shodagar's son, Lokhindar and his wife Behula. Lokhindar was killed by Monusha through, with a snake bite and uh, he died and Behula carried his body down the river to the heavens and where she danced, where she pleased the god, uh, gods and then ultimately the uh, issue was resolved and uh, Lokhindar was given back life and Chand Shodagar uh, agreed to offer worship to Monusha, but using the left hand and not the right hand. The next slide, please. And so here we have, for instance, these kind of stories of the Mongol Kabbo, of mythology, etc. You also have these contemporary events, like this is a, a depiction of the 9-11 Twin Tower attack done by Moina Chitrakor. So the uh, Chitrakors, these Potua women, they all of them say, they agree that for Potuchitra to be a viable career in the present day, it has to become relevant to the culture in which it exists. And this is the way in which the folk art has always sustained itself. So uh, uh, now the Potuchitra has a, not just an urban market, it has a large global market. And so many of them venture out in these kind of um, new themes. And uh, the folk art, uh, on the one hand, it retains its root, but it also uh, uh, adapts itself to the commercial society. So they are using their entrepreneurial spirit to respond to globalization, which reflects their, uh, their predecessors. The next uh, slide 
here we have a tsunami pot and the, there are these two ladies uh, rani chitrakar and yamuna chitrakar who did a series of um, pots on the tsunami of uh, december uh, 2004 and the next slide we have uh, rani chitrakar song uh, on the tsunami uh where she uh, this slide shows uh rani chitrakar singing and uh, the tsunami song and let's go to the last slide and i will end with a video uh, of this slide this is the lockdown pot the lockdown pot this is a, a pot where uh it is in a, in a uh where uh, the news of the lockdown is being spread and if we see if you look at the video properly it is in the rural landscape it is not something which is done in the uh, urban um, craft fair or anything and let's listen to the song first and then i'll comment on it the video sabai mile haga satetan ho jana ga sabai mile haga satetan kol jari bharat sarkar ek us din e lockdown darkar kol jari bharat sarkar okay so uh, this song is about the lockdown and this is in the nature of an announcement so if you see the words of the song we it says we must be aware that the india government has announced a 21 day lockdown the virus will not spread and we will be able to defeat it the virus is dangerous we have to take care the government does not want us to be harmed so give your consent to the lockdown follow the government's words we will all be locked at home no public meetings let us live ourselves and let us let allow others to live take this oath so the language um, is a little more official in this and uh, it's if we compare it with say even the coronavirus song the language is slightly different that is much more in the normal mode of a pot singing where you know there is a lamentation and what shall i tell you how can i say what is the sad event that has come and overshadowed the world you know this lamentation which is a very normal theme in a in the pot singing this is not there and it is like a government announcement which makes me wonder whether this is of course commissioned i have no idea whether this is commissioned by the uh, district authorities or not but as we saw in this presentation today the uh, potochitro is not just confined to mythology or religious themes but it has it addresses a vast range of issues and the same way it has been also used for promotion of literacy etc um and these are changes which had been occurring since the 19th century itself as we saw how they reflected the life of calcutta and today they are reflecting contemporary times thank you so i'll end it here uh, thank you um 
so very much, uh, Sanjukta. Uh, this is uh, quite uh, quite something. I remember uh, one of my very dear friends, Tarshito uh, Stripoli, who's done some work with uh, some of the tribal artists across India, and also he's been working in Bangladesh. And um, uh, I remember when our very dear friend, uh, uh, who is one of the top uh, uh, singers in India, Tumri singers especially, uh, Vidya Shah, um, they did an exhibition in Delhi and uh, there was a long Patachitra which Tarshito designed, made by the Odisha uh, artists. And it's a Indo-Italian project, where we are in fact, <laughs> it's a seminar itself Indo-Italian, isn't it? And there was a, in Delhi, there was a whole Patachitra being shown with art of uh, uh, Tarshito mixed with the, made by the tribal artist. It was a together, it was a joint pro production. And Vidya Shah was singing, uh, you know, Raga along with that. So I was reminded with the songs, especially the social media, uh, you know, viral videos that you showed us. Thank you for that because it was, I was, <laughs> I was having a, again, another nostalgic moment uh, looking at Tarshito's work. A storytelling of a different kind, how that has been adapted even in by, even by artists from around the world who are collaborating with the artists from Bengal and Odisha, both in West Bengal and in uh, East Bengal or Bangladesh, uh, which is right now. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, there are, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, several questions. But before uh, we come to the questions by the uh, by our, by your audience, by our, by those who are virtually. Um, uh, joining the session, um, uh, I will read them out uh, to both of you uh, in, a, in a moment. But can you tell us uh, something about the story of the of the Mangal Kavya, uh, but, you know, that you showed? Yeah, uh, well, uh, there are these. Uh, in fact, the Mongol Kapu pots are very popular, and uh, these are uh, the uh, uh, Bengali, the uh, medieval Bengali literature. And there are different kinds of Mongol Kabbo. So there is the Manusha Mongol, there is the Dharma Mongol, Chondi Mongol, and all uh, uh, Manusha. I've shown the scene from Manusha Mongol, but Chondi Mongol, Dharma Mongol, all of these are depicted in the pot. And they have these stories which are well known and particularly well known even today because some of these Mongol Kabbo stories are still. Uh, compulsory school texts. So uh, even in an urban setting, um, kids know it. So this is something you grow up with. And uh, these Mongol Kapo pots are uh, really, really uh, popular uh, among the religious pots. More uh, Ramayana pots, yes, but I think I have seen more of the Mughal Kapo pots than I have seen of the Ramayana pot. And also, uh, uh, I had I don't have it here, but I have it in my study in I the see. university, a pot, which is amazing, where it showed uh, the education in, uh, it was a scene from uh, Dharma Mongol, where it was showing that a young boy was getting educated. And um, in the education, when they're showing, they're show using contemporary motives. So it is a school where the boy is learning A, B, C, D, how to write the alphabets, but the English alphabet. So this is the way in which, you know, the contemporary, the past, uh, this is constantly coming together and getting reinvented. And, you know, when you're talking about the Italian, Indo-Italian venture, I was, um, uh, there are some colleagues of mine in Milan who had started a project with school children. They had, they were also fascinated by uh, Noya and they had been to Noya. They had taken their students to Noya. And this colleague is from the Department of uh, Education and they were starting a new pedagogic uh, experiment with school children where they use, get the school children to make pot Porto uh, Chitro with their own experiences, which they then paste together and they do the scroll singing and painting. So I think this is a very uh, interesting way in which the Porto Chitro travels uh, across countries. That is uh, quite, uh, quite fantastic, actually. Um, and what about the, um, uh, you know, the community leaders? Uh, how do they view the painting of Hindu deities by Muslim artists. Uh, that's one. And if there are, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, paintings by Muslim artists of, uh, of course, they cannot, uh, they do not paint uh, in Islam. They do not paint uh, 
for example, any one of the prophets. But do you uh, see any of the Islamic paintings to do with other histories or other Islamic like mosque or some of the motifs with the Muslim artists, the artisans? But have you seen some of them? But of course, before that, uh, how do the community leaders, if, if at all, it is being seen that Muslim artists are painting Hindu deities? Yes, this is, of course, something um, uh, uh, this is a little um, complicated because this is a practice which has gone on for a long time. It's not just that it's today that it's happening. And as I said, uh, they have uh, these uh, they are Muslim artists and uh, they have Muslim names, Hindu names. They perform both rituals and they consider this to be part of their identity. Um, it is only, I think, um, sometimes in recent times that some community leaders uh, object. And this also, I uh, would argue, you know, this is also uh, framed within this whole question of women's empowerment because really some of the artists like Monimala Chitrakar, Jomuna Chitrakar, Rani Chitrakar, uh, Shorno Chitrakar, they are really empowered women and they call upon the others. This has really changed their lives and they, Monimala in the clip that I showed you has been talking about this. So this is um, slightly vexed. Monimala, um, um, I don't know whether I really should publicly state it, but it was an interview and she said that she has been asked, uh, questioned on this at times, but she does not bow down to this kind of pressure. But there are some younger people who do. Uh, so this is really the empowerment is there, the way out is there um, and the successful artists are really proud of their achievement and very rightly so. Uh, but this is still slightly vexatious, yeah. you know, this is a problem. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. No, you, may, you may continue. No, no. I'll, and I'll your second afterwards. question uh, was about, uh, this is also very interesting because in the eight, 19th century, the gaji pots were very popular. I am not so familiar with the pot, potachitra of Bangladesh. Uh, because I have not traveled very widely in Bangladesh, so I will not be able to say no, what they yeah. do. My question uh, was about more about the West Bengal area. Yeah, not, so no, not, no, no, I was just I was not crossing the border to Bangladesh right now. No, no, the reason why I'm saying it is because in uh, uh, you had a lot of these gaji pots, and some of the gaji pots are still painted, but they're not really as popular as the ones of Ramayana and Mongol Kabbu. So if you go to any of the art fairs or you go to the book fair or anywhere you see the paintings, it's always, you know, filled with Mongol Kabbu and Ramayana pots. But you, I have not seen any pictures of mosques or depiction of Islamic culture, but I might be wrong because, you know, there might be. The reason why I brought up Bangladesh is if we make a comparison with the Katha motifs. Katha is the uh, traditional needlework which is done. You know, the pictures which are embroidered with very simple running stitch. Now, in the Katha embroidery, if you compare across the border, their motives are very different. In the, the Katha embroidery in West Bengal are um, mainly... Uh, this particular motive of Muslim weddings. This is very popular. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful depictions of Muslim weddings. And you can see that the wedding is taking place in a Muslim village where, uh, and the whole works. So there might be, you know, you have to see the market. Who are they producing it for? Who is going to buy? And so and what is the dominant culture of a particular place? So that would, I think, uh, determine the uh, themes that are there in the pot. There is a there is a problem with my earphone, but if you can uh, uh, hear my question, of course, you will. My microphone is working; only my earphone is uh, um, uh, gone off. But um, uh, if you can, um, um, I, I was basically sharing uh, something, uh, you know, with you in the sense that. Uh, um, this whole idea of uh, um, cross community, uh, you know, uh, bridges. I mean, uh, you know, which which has uh, inter-community, inter-communal, uh, uh, or inter-religious 
sort of conversations. Uh, Muslim singers singing, uh, like for example, the langas of Rajasthan, the manganiyars of Rajasthan. Um, there's uniqueness between them. The langas uh, would have only Muslim patrons uh, and whom they would sing to. Of course, now with tourism and so on and so forth, uh, it has become uh, different uh, with the tourist idea that, that people go, all kinds of people go to visit them or they get invited on the on the commercial, I mean, it's a it's a stage. It's a commercial stage where uh, Langa community, although they only had Muslim patrons, the Jajbans, as they would call them, the local chieftains, and so on and so forth, they would be living in uh, Muslim uh, villages, uh, dominated because that's where they would be serving, the, uh, leading the rituals. But the Manganya uh, 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 musicians. Uh, were unique in the sense they were the Muslim bards of Hindu communities. Uh, in fact, uh, they would they would not be even marriages between the two. They were like two different communities. Uh, they were they were within the Muslim community. There would be uh, uh, preferences of uh, marriages and so on and so forth. Um, but but then we have, for example, the Rababi singers of Gurbani who were never told by the gurus to convert. Uh, until uh, when, when pre-partition India, the socio-political reality, uh, uh, you know, sort of came, the communal tensions were raised. Then many, uh, many of the musicians began to be asked, Rababi as well, if you like Guru Nanak so much, why don't you convert? And that was totally against the, uh, the whole ethos of, uh, uh, of, of the Gursik Panth. And there were some singers who were non-Muslim singers of Gurbani. I'm reminded of one gentleman called Chaman Lal uh, from Delhi, who was a Sindhi. Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, I remember hearing about him that he was told by some of the Sikh uh, right-wingers that, oh, if you, if you sing Gurbani so much and if you like Guru Nanak so much, why don't you take Amrit, why don't you become a Sikh? As if that was somehow a qualification and I think the, uh, the uniqueness about the Indic, uh, uh, the in idea of India has been that across, uh, uh, you know, times, across centuries, uh, India is a country where all religions that there are, uh, uh, you know, I'm not talking about the Aboriginal, Ab Aboriginal faiths in America or uh, uh, South America and so on and so forth. I'm talking about actual formed religions. India has all of them from Jews to Christianity just within 50, 60 years of uh, uh, the, uh, the said, uh, you know, passing of Christ, there was a church uh, uh, already established uh, in, in South India, in Kerala. So we as a, as a country uh, have all the religions that there are uh, in the world and there is bound to be uh, uh, inter-religious kind of exchange, be it art, be it poetry, be it literature. We have Alama Iqbal's writing about Buddha, about uh, Guru Nanak. We have had uh, Hindu and Sikh and other poets, uh, you know, writing about uh, uh, some of the other, uh, you know, let's say some other peers and uh, something about uh, the advent of Hazrat Muhammad and so on and so forth. But it's, it's interesting how recent times people may, as you mentioned, that they, uh, the, the Muslim artists may have been asked by some, well, uh, how is it that you're painting this? How do you see that? Um, no, you see, this is something I cannot really speak offhand because uh, I did not follow this up with a further visit to Naya because I was interviewing uh, Moni, uh, this lady uh, in uh, Calcutta. Um, uh, Tiziana, we are all now on the screen. Uh, I've had issues with my uh, with my earphones, uh, but. Uh, I'm now going I'm to here. improvise with my um, um, Bluetooth here. Uh, I'm speaker. Here. Yeah, here. Um, I'll have to make the volume lower. Uh, if, if anybody hears, uh, some of our listeners, uh, we have several uh, viewers around, uh, around the world watching. Uh, can you say something, Tiziana? Can you hear my voice? Thank you to you, yes. all of you, yeah. and uh, okay. to um, the people who are following us. And uh, Sanjukta, thank you so much there. Oh, no, and but before we, go to, before we go to the thanks, we have some questions. You have still to answer some questions. Tiziana, you cannot yeah. escape uh, so quickly. 
So uh, there is uh, there is a question. It was just that yes, I have to sort my. Yes, but to speak slowly is because of my hair and also. Yeah, can... yeah. Okay, I will speak the question slowly, but okay. I won't uh, slow my uh, otherwise my stride. Um, so first, there is a question that came. I will go in order of uh, the way they were written, first come, first serve uh, basis. Um, they were of many compliments, of course. Um, there's a, uh, I think, a note to you from Supriya Banerjee. Uh, she says, thanks. I will just read them out. Thanks, Professor, for your lecture. I would like to ask uh, about the divisions in the entire frame of Patachitra in uh, Raghurajpur. I noticed that there, were, there are various layers to the big image which are separated by dark lines. Is there a definitive rule to separating one frame from another of the entire Patachitra comprises of the, of, of comprising of one interrelated story? I think that's for Tiziana, is it? Of Raghurajpur? Yes. Uh, um, um, as, as you have known, uh, they have seen, uh, uh, the different episodes are sometimes uh, are well detached by the some lines uh, uh, in bold, but sometimes one episode goes directly into another one because there is not a, this uh, in Indian art too. Too you can see the uh, the special the, the peculiar space in which uh, uh, the space is not in and the episodes are not in temporal sequence. So one episode goes in another one, and in the middle there are also another episode. Is a quello che si chiama la narrazione simultanea. Simultanea is that in a one episode you can have different moments of this in this of the same episode and in uh, Raguraj in this part of Chitra in Ragurajpur you have a lot of na different narrations I abbiamo una narrazione lineare linear narrations as you have seen e abbiamo anche una narrazione simultanea is a, a, a very interesting because those different kind of narrations are Kept all together. Okay, wonderful. Um, there's another uh, question. Um, uh, I hope that there's no possibility of a to and fro. There can be a pushback or a count or a follow-up question. Uh, unless it comes, I will uh, move on to the next one. Uh, there's a question from Giorgia Durigon. Uh, I will try to read it in Italian. Avrei una domanda per la dottoressa Lorenzetti. Questo Io... tipo di patacetra è esclusivamente legato all'ambito devozionale, inoltre la modalità di rappresentazione dei episodi mitologici, mitologici e delle divinità ha subito delle modifiche nel tempo adan, adatando, adat, adat, adattandosi a spe specifiche esigenze dei tempi moderni, come può uh, accedere con altri tipi di arte pittorica, oppure essendo legate all'ambito devozionale sono rimaste nel tempo sempre uh, piuttosto coerenti con la, uh, con la loro forma conseguita? Con consue consueta. Consueta. Sì, dunque, eh, per quanto riguarda proprio i pattacitra dell'Orissa, eh, ovviamente essendo un'opera, eh, un'arte eh, un devozionale collegata anche al, al Tempio di Puri e ai, eh, alle celebrazioni che si svolgono al, dal, nel Tempio di Puri e che quindi si eh, suppone che con lievi varianti, certo varianti, sia rimaste uguali, è un'arte che eh, possiamo tranquillamente dire che da eh, quando è nata e quindi eh, certo non abbiamo delle testimonianze del XII secolo ma eh, pensiamo che eh, all'inizio eh, queste tre divinità vengano messe come dicevo eh, su questo, questa, questa pittura particolare del, di cotone dietro nel santuario quando le, i veri, le veri di, di divinità, cioè le divinità di legno venivano portate in fuori 
e, e quindi eh, pendevano come fosse appunto una, una, uh, una coda di, 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 di tessuto e che però era appunto uh, di, di diciamo, coto, eh, quasi cartone. E quindi questo credo che c'era, ci sono testimonianze eh, anche nei Purana. Per quanto riguarda queste pitture che vi ho fatto vedere invece, queste abbiamo delle testimonianze che sono rimaste um, così, diciamo, da, dal, dal, dall'Ottocento abbiamo testimonianze di due inglesi che le descrivono, inizio 800 e, e, e quindi anzi comincia l'interesse per l'India, anche mh, mh, fra gli indiani per queste pitture. E, e, essendo quindi, ripeto, temi classici, eh, temi che eh, si tramandano da, eh, da, da, dall'epica antica, da generazioni, l'episodio del Ramayana, l'episodio del Mahabharata, le dieci incarnazioni di Vishnu, sono rimaste, credo, uguali. Ci sono anche dei piccoli, di piccole differenze eh, di episodi che però sono gli stessi ma vengono posti in, in spazi diversi quindi per questi <ride> possiamo dire che dall'ottocento in poi e specialmente dopo l'indipendenza dell'India sono rimasti uguali essendo opere devozionali, poi certo diciamo eh, non abbiamo delle testimonianze che vanno molto molto indietro a parte appunto quelle del XII-XIII secolo che vengono messe nella magria spero di aver risposto. Al contrario, devo dire, dei, dei Pattacitra che ci ha descritto eh, la professoressa Sanjukta Dasgutta, che invece seguono gli eventi eh, sociali e storici dei, a, dei, dei periodi, anche contemporanei, abbiamo visto lo tsunami, adesso ci tenevo molto a farvi vedere questo, eh, questi Pattacitra del lockdown e della... Del coronavirus, ci tenevo moltissimo perché qui abbiamo due proprio diversi: quello tradizionale che si tramanda per secoli e quello invece che cambia con gli eventi storici. And uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Deepna Rao is asking, I mean, is hoping that the session recording uh, could be available on Facebook uh, and a link emailed on request. Uh, so, as I have, uh, I think, I see a note from the International Institute of South Asian Studies. Uh, yes, this will. Be, I'm just reading on this. This video will be on the page of the ISS, um, and I think you can obviously write. And I'm sure Dr. Uh, Lorenzetti, uh, who's nice, uh, will. I'm sure she will share the link uh, to all those who would request that. Uh, there's a question. I think uh, Professor Sanjukta for you uh, from Georgia Durigon. Uh, Uh, are there Pattachitra of the contemporary themes uh, type representing the struggle for independence? If yes, how is this related to the low caste origin of the painters? Uh, where, were, they political, where they were, were they politically active? Secondly, as far as Jadupat is uh, concerned, uh, were they simply representing the rituals or the paintings were actually an instrument used during the rituals? And uh, uh, she thank thanks you, you too. Uh, thank you, uh, Georgia. Very in, in, uh, good questions. Well, in the first case, um, uh, there are um, uh, some uh, parts on the uh, national movement, on uh, uh, Gandhi, the freedom struggle. Can you uh, lean back a bit, uh, Sanjukta? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's, so, good. that's a good distinction. Uh, yeah. There are these uh, parts on um, the national movement, and you have to remember that parts can also be commissioned. You know, so if you have a theme in mind, you can get a potua to do it. It's not as though uh, the potua only draws according to their own interests. They can also um, extend their art to, you know, uh, any kind of theme that is put across by the patron. But um, potuas, uh, in the potua art, you don't find these concerns coming out so clearly that Uh, caste issues, etc. Um, in the general Potua art, which is easily available, you don't really see it. Whether there are any other specific uh, uh, scrolls, I do not know. 
uh, but this would be interesting to follow up whether of course it can also tell uh, the stories because these are about telling stories so basically it's also to uh, you have to see who is commissioning or who is listening who is going to be the patron and talking about the patronage this is again a story that monimala chitrakot told me this is interesting because she told me that in her family there is that tradition that potuas would often act as go betweens between different uh, say landlord families etc and sometimes uh, they would uh, use uh their art to inscribe hidden messages and carry this you know two different uh, uh, uh families ruling groups etc uh and they had that access uh to various spaces which perhaps others did not so uh this again is a story uh i have not seen any evidence it will be difficult to prove but it's a very interesting story about how potuas were these kind of go betweens different uh, power groups etc in the rural world now jadu pot uh, that the mrittu pot that we talked uh, talk, uh, about those are actually part of the ritual the ritual demands that this picture of the uh this impression it's not a very uh, realistic impression but this figure this impression is it is done without the pupils of the eye and the ritual requires that the pupils are painted the painting of the pupil means that the dead soul is now can be is released from hell uh, so that is part and parcel of the ritual but there are also some pots uh, this this is a specific mrittu pot but there are many other pots which shows uh, many adivasi uh, uprisings uh, ad issues uh, of adivasi lives and normally these pots are uh, show the everyday life of the uh, adivasis and these are very popular adivasi dance their life in the adivasi village adivasi um, uh, all of these uh, and um, many of these are not done by adivasis themselves so these potuas are not always they are not adivasis they can be some of them are santal artists but they don't uh, the nowadays the mass production of these santal pots are not always done by santals and there are some specific pots which also show the santal rebellion and in fact the pot that i showed uh, the picture that i showed that was a picture of the adivasi life and uh, if we go back to that if we can go back to that slide then it shows uh, the adivasis being uh, tortured by money lenders uh, the kind of demands that are being made on them that is a depiction of that so and uh, so, uh, just to um uh, have a, i mean the independence for bangladesh for example uh, of uh, bangladesh becoming independent this i mean to do with politics and independence uh, one independence is uh, for example 1947 related yes when pakistan was formed but in 1971 talking of um, um, uh, you know a, a, a an art form uh, being uh, politically used um, a lot of propaganda uh, etc were was done uh were there uh, uh you know did did this come into your in your new stride did you find something like that that uh these patachitras uh, and all were also used in that uh in that uh, freedom struggle or independence struggle if as the bangladeshis call it would call it of course um again uh, this is a uh, i'm afraid i will i do not have the answer to that because i'm not at all familiar with the patachitra in bangladesh So no, I'm talking about I, I being from have... our side, from the Indian side, in the sense that because India was oh, okay. uh, uh, the, no, the military and the government seen. was helping the uh, the the uh, you know the the uh, freedom fighters, the people who were fighting for Bangladesh's independence. Yeah, I don't think I have seen any because you have, you have seen, remember okay. that the uh, Patuchitra was being revived in course of the 1970s. So I, I don't. Think that uh it the uh, all these showing the contemporary events these are much later much later okay okay so i mean uh, so that that so also answers the question in a different manner because if they are talking about my question would have been which independence because there have been so many independence struggles in india that uh, which independence and then if it is an art form being used by 
certain political actors then which political actors were they uh, or which pol which political ideology they belong to then it becomes very detailed anyway but that's uh, that's very nice uh, it's been a <clears throat> wonderful wonderful uh, session and uh, um, I'm sure uh, uh, this this uh, session would would uh, uh, raise a lot of interest uh, and and uh, spur further research in the in the uh, in the field. Um, so um, I'll I'll just say a couple of lines uh, uh, in Italian and before after that I'll sort of thank you all and uh, in English. Abbiamo così concluso questo viaggio in in un'arte che ha tradizione uh, antiche, uh, ma che è sempre viva e in continua evoluzione. Un'arte che è strettamente collegata uh, sia alla ritualità che troviamo nei templi hindu, uh, templi hindu uh, sia alla società indiana attuale. Uh, so friends, uh, uh, as you would have seen that um, uh, we've, we've had two presentations from the two major regions where the Patachitra, um, uh, you know, uh, they are drawn, they're painted and storytelling being done and both from rituals uh, to, the, uh, to the Hindu uh, temple related, uh, rituals related uh, uh, activities. Uh, we've seen, uh, as Dr. Dorenzetti was also mentioning about, uh, that the, the Patachitras are also taken as souvenirs, but of course they are uh, not just, yes, for, for non-practitioners, uh, it would be seen as art or decoration, but or part of home, you know, internal decoration, interior uh, decoration or decor. But uh, for practicing Hindus who have uh, their, uh, their, their um, sort of, um, affiliation to the Jagannath Puri temple or other deities that there are, they, would, they do uh, install them in their sacred spaces at their private temples and so on and so forth. And it was wonderful to uh, hear a very detailed, uh, uh, you know, uh, presentation from, uh, to do with West Bengal or Indian, Indian Bengal uh, from magic pots and so on. You've already seen that, I don't have to repeat it. But really, I, I learned a lot. I was uh, quite revealing the kind of details, the kind of... Uh, research that has gone into uh, both the papers and I compliment the uh, presenters, the two, two scholars who have uh, joined the session hosted by the Institute of uh, South Asian Studies headed by Professor Lorenzetti and uh, well uh, and I of course heading the Anad Foundation I'm caught up here so it was a presentation that we brought to you together two foundations working we've done plenty of projects in the past and, and I hope uh, unless uh, Tiziana uh, you know um, uh, were to, were to, uh, I don't know, she does, I don't know if she gets angry, I've always have seen her smiling and happy, um, <laughs> I don't know, I was about to say maybe you get angry with me sometimes if we start, if we stop collaborations, but uh, I don't know if you get angry, it's a, Sanjukta, can you bear any witness, do you, do you know, <laughs> have you ever seen Tiziana getting angry at people? <laughs> But it was lovely. Anyway, thank you. I don't think that uh, silly uh, remark from me requires a response from anyone of you. <laughs> <laughs> it was just figure of speech. Uh, after a serious seminar, I, I thought it, we must have a little laughter before we, before we call, it, call it a Saturday. All right. Thank you so very much. And it's been a pleasure. You want to say thank something, Sanjukta and Tiziana, before, before we sign off? Uh, no, thank you very much, uh, Tiziana. Uh, uh, but, uh, thank you to you. No, 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 it was so uh, really very interesting to us. All of us, die. <laughs> okay, and thanks very much to everybody who came and joined and listened. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the patient I, to follow us, okay. <laughs> ciao, ragazzi. Right. Yes. Ciao, ciao, ragazzi. Ciao, ciao. Buona, buona, buona serata, um, you know, buona India, ciao. and a uh, very good afternoon, uh, Italia. And to everyone who uh, who's been watching and will watch in the future, this is for the social media. Uh, my blessings and my prayers, my best wishes on behalf of uh, the International Institute of South Asian Studies and the Anath Foundation in Delhi. Thank you.